Hi everyone, in this lesson we're talking about the risk factors for getting vaginal candidiasis. So vaginal candidiasis is also known as vulvovaginal candidiasis or a yeast infection. So it's referred to often as vulvovaginal candidiasis because it can involve both the vulva and the vagina. And throughout this lesson we're going to refer to it as vulvovaginal candidiasis. It is a vaginal infection with candida species. And candida are fungi. So they're going to be fungal species that invade superficially into the vaginal epithelium. Now one particular species of candida is going to cause the majority of cases and that is candida albicans. Though candida albicans accounts for 90% of cases. There are some other candida species that can cause infection as well. And it's also important to note that candida albicans can be a normal part of skin flora on certain people. So some people can have candida albicans along with many different other microbial species that don't cause any issues or infections. But if there is some disruption for whatever reason, candida albicans can increase in number and cause infection. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about the risk factors as we go through this lesson. And vulvovaginal candidiasis is a very common condition. It is estimated to affect up to 70% of female patients at some point in their life. And 5 to 8% of females will suffer from recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis is going to be at least three episodes of a yeast infection per year. Now the topic of this lesson is that there are multiple factors that increase the risk of having vulvovaginal candidiasis or a yeast infection. We're going to talk about those and why they occur throughout this lesson. So the first risk factor we're going to talk about is states of increased endogenous estrogen. So endogenous estrogen is going to be estrogen that is produced in our own body. So this is going to be a problem because high estrogen levels alter the vaginal environment. And it does it via several mechanisms, including increasing glycogen within the vaginal cavity. So high estrogen levels can increase glycogen content in the vaginal cavity and candida species can actually use glycogen as an energy source to grow and proliferate. High estrogen also decreases antifungal activity of vaginal epithelial cells, and it also alters immune cell functioning. So all of this can play a role in increasing the risk of having vulvovaginal candidiasis. So some conditions that lead to increased endogenous estrogen include pregnancy. So pregnancy can lead to high levels of estrogen, and pregnancy not only can increase estrogen levels, but it can also increase glycogen content in the vaginal cavity as well. And another state of increased endogenous estrogen production is obesity. The reason that this occurs is because in obesity, we have more adipose tissue or more fat tissue, and adipose tissue can lead to production of estrogen. Another important risk factor for vulval vaginal candidiasis is exogenous estrogen use. So this again leads to an increased estrogen state. And instead of it being produced in the body, it's going to be taken from outside of the body. So that's exogenous estrogen use. Some examples of exogenous estrogen use include combined oral contraceptives, so birth control pills, especially older birth control pills, they used to have a higher estrogen content, so they are more likely to cause a yeast infection. But the newer ones have less estrogen, so they're less likely to cause a yeast infection, but they still can increase the risk. Using a patch or a vaginal ring or using hormone replacement therapy, all of these can lead to higher levels of estrogen within the vaginal cavity ultimately leading to some of these vaginal environmental effects we talked about before. Another risk factor is type 2 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes can lead to high levels of glucose, and the high levels of glucose can actually promote growth of candida albicans. So the reason that this occurs is because if we have high levels of glucose in our blood, it can lead to high levels of glucose in our tissues, and that can include the vaginal cavity. And the candida albicans yeast or fungus can use that glucose as an energy source and grow and proliferate. So this is the reason why we can see issues with candida albicans in type 2 diabetes. And this is particularly important in patients who have severe type 2 diabetes or have issues with controlling their glucose. So you can imagine if you have very high levels of glucose chronically, you're more likely to have issues with candida albicans infections. And not only that, type 2 diabetes can also cause immune system dysfunction. So if we're having issues with immune system functioning, this can also lead to increased risk of infections in general, and one of those is a yeast infection. Another risk factor is immunosuppression, so a suppressed immune system. So this ties in with type 2 diabetes. Immune system functioning is necessary to control and limit fungal growth. 
So some examples of immunosuppression can include chemotherapy, being HIV positive or human immunodeficiency virus infections, and AIDS, glucocorticoid use, especially systemic use, and smoking as well. So smoking can also be associated with an increased risk of candida infections. Contraceptive devices are also another risk factor. So we'll talk about examples here first. Some of these include diaphragms, intrauterine devices, or IUDs, and vaginal sponges. The reason that contraceptive devices can increase the risk of a yeast infection or vulvovaginal candidiasis is because of the structural or mechanical disruptions to the vaginal flora. And you can imagine if you're inputting or placing these devices within the vaginal cavity, this can lead to disruptions of the vaginal flora and increase the likelihood of having some issue with a disruption of certain microbial species and allowing the candida species to outcompete those other microbial species. And another important risk factor is recent antibiotic use. So antibiotic use can essentially kill off the good vaginal flora. So there's so many different species within the vaginal cavity. A lot of these species can keep other species of microbes in check if we're using certain antibiotics, especially broad spectrum antibiotics. So antibiotics that cover many different species of bacteria. If we're using those antibiotics, they can kill off good bacteria within the vaginal cavity, leaving the fungal species candida in their place. And then that can lead to candida having less competitors and allowing that species of candida to proliferate and grow and cause an infection. And some antibiotics can be particularly notorious for causing yeast infections. And one of those is amoxicillin. And it can be quite common for yeast infection to occur after antibiotic use, especially again, broad spectrum antibiotics, it has been estimated that one quarter to one third of female patients get a yeast infection after recent use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Another risk factor is tight fitting garments or tight fitting clothing. So tight clothing can cause more moisture in higher temperatures. This can promote the growth of candida in the vaginal cavity. And especially it's going to be an issue with clothing that is non-breathable. And another risk factor is hygiene issues. So reduced hygiene or hygiene issues like douching can increase the risk of having a yeast infection. So with douching, this can alter and disrupt the vaginal flora. So the normal protective good vaginal microbes can be disrupted by douching. And then toilet wiping in the wrong direction can also spread candida or other bad bacteria toward the vaginal opening. So this is also another hygiene issue that can be a risk factor. And then having a genetic predisposition can also be another risk factor. So Genetic predispositions are especially important in recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So some patients may not have any other risk factors that we talked about before, but they have recurrent episodes of yeast infections. So again, at least three per year. And we can see this occurring in families. So some families can have members of their family having recurrent episodes of yeast infection for no obvious reason. And this can be due to a genetic predisposition. So certain genes have been implicated. Some of these include the gene responsible for encoding mannose binding lectin, dectin-1 gene, and also if patients have high levels of interleukin-4 or IL-4, that's a cytokine in immune system functioning. So if patients have high levels of IL-4 or interleukin-4, they're more likely to have yeast infections. And the reason is because interleukin-4 inhibits anti candida responses. So it inhibits the ability to control or destroy or suppress candidal growth. This is the reason why we can have issues with certain patients having recurrent yeast infections. And then another important factor that can increase the risk of a yeast infection is increased sexual activity. So it's important to note that vulvovaginal candidiasis is not a sexually transmitted infection. But sexual activity can increase the likelihood of having vulvovaginal candidiasis. So the reason is because the sexual activity can cause disruptions to vaginal flora. So it's the introduction of new microbes or just the simple disruption of the vaginal flora in general that can trigger candida to overgrow for whatever reason. So that is another factor that can increase the risk of having a yeast infection. Please check out my full lesson on vulvovaginal candidiasis and please check out my lesson on bacterial vaginosis. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.